behalf of the Europe region of the Council for World Mission, a warm welcome to this series of what we are calling conversation points around overarching theme, the overarching theme of flourishing, life flourishing spaces. And for those of you whom I have not met as yet, I am Michael Jagasar and I'm the Mission Secretary for Europe and Sai, who you could see in this frame here, or one of these frames here, is our program associate. And for those of us who don't know or who need to be reminded, CWM is a worldwide partnership of Christian churches. We noted last week there are 32 members are committed to sharing their resources, including people, money, skills, and insights globally to carry on or carry out rather, perhaps it's carry on, but carry out God's mission locally. And we are of course located in six regions of which Europe is one. And for the next period of CWM's strategic work, we have a vision of life flourishing communities, living out God's promise of a new heaven and a new earth. Hence, we have sort of working around a strap line that we are calling life flourishing spaces. So these conversation points are intended to do a number of things, to grow awareness, to encourage intentional presence and engagement, to cascade insights and learning, and to energize our practices, and of course, to build solidarity. And the contributors, as we have noted last week, could be colleagues from CWM, and also those that we are supporting in our academic accompaniment program of whom Victoria is one and commissioned researchers supported by CWM or supported by ecumenical partners or supported by local member churches and colleagues anywhere who are engaging in cutting edge pieces of work. So for a second conversation point, our presenter is Victoria Turner, a PhD student at the University of Edinburgh and a younger member of the United Reformed Church. I still like to count myself as young, so I'm noting that Victoria is a younger member of the United Reformed Church. Now, um, Victoria will say more about herself and Lindsay would also be introducing her. Victoria's topic would be youth object of or partners in mission and ecumenism. But moderating the conversation will be Lindsay Brown. Lindsay is a trustee of CWM UK and a member of the CWM's board of directors and also a training and development officer of the Eastern Synod of the United Reformed Church. So I now would like to hand over to Lindsay and Victoria. Lindsay. Thank you very much, Michael. And I just want to reiterate that very warm welcome um, to you all this afternoon. It's great to see lots of familiar faces, but also new faces. So I hope we uh, find this afternoon enriching together. Um, just to take you briefly through, uh, it, it's a very simple programme for, for this afternoon. We're going to start with a presentation from Victoria um, and then we'll go into breakout rooms. Um, both Victoria and I will be coming into your breakout rooms to uh, participate in your conversations. So um, expect us to pop in and out uh, during that time. Uh, and during that time, we'll um, hear questions from you and comments from you that we'll then bring back to the main space at the end uh, so that we can direct those questions uh, to Victoria. Uh, so that's the, 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 the basic sort of shape of our session together. Um, I'm really, it really is a really great pleasure to introduce Victoria this afternoon. Um, she has great personal and research experience of youth participation in mission um, and also of national and global ecumenism. Um, she is, uh, she has a long list of, of, of achievements and participation. She's currently the Mission Council and General Assembly representative for the United Reformed Church Youth. She sits on the United Reformed Church Baptist Interfaith Enabling Group. She's a trustee for Churches Together in England. She's a trustee for the Society for Ecumenical Studies. She sits on the World Council of Reformed Churches Discernment Group and is on their planning group for their 2021 Youth Summit. 
She has a really refreshing way of applying theology, theory and research to real world situations. And that's what these uh, webinars are about. We're looking for on the ground transformation uh, for our local practice to be really energized um, and, and not just to stay in, in the academic books and the academic writings. We need uh, real change in our local communities. Um, as you heard from Michael, um, uh, Victoria is being accompanied by a CWM um, uh, programme at the moment. She's also taken part in the European Youth Programme and Global Youth Programme for Global Youth Forum for CWM. Um, and she's currently undertaking a PhD in Edinburgh, uh, which she will uh, talk to you more about because uh, part of that is the topic for this afternoon. So I'm going to now hand over to Victoria. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you so much, Lindsay and Michael. Uh, I think my uh, slide just put up a poll. So before I start, we could take a little moment to answer for me. Does your church treat young people as objects of or partners of mission? Just to kind of test the water, which one do you think it is from your personal experience? OK, so as Michael uh, said earlier, the, the uh, title for this presentation is our youth, are they objects or partners in mission and exploration through the case study of the Iona community? Um, so my PhD is looking um, basically at mission from a non-evangelical perspective. Uh, I'm in the field of world Christianity and it tends to overlook the more um, creative ways of doing mission, I guess. Um, and I think, I, when I understand mission, I, I always am kind of conscious of where ecumenism and youth fit in, because I think it's very dependent. Um, does ecumenism come first? Is ecumenism part of mission? Is, can you do mission without ecumenism? So I think these questions are really important. And also young people, I think um, like where they fit in is always very interesting. So for me, when I started my undergrad degree at Bristol, um, I thought I would be doing like Eastern religions and Hinduism and things like that. Um, but very quickly, I kind of wanted to study my own religion. I was doing lots of stuff with CWM and found it really exciting. Um, and for my dissertation, uh, I changed the topic really quite late on because throughout my undergraduate studies at Bristol, um, unfortunately, uh, 18, I think it was around 18 students in the three years I was there committed suicide. It was. Bristol, Bristol was that university at the time when I was there, always in the news. Um, so that really moved me to kind of write my dissertation about like mental health and how we can help students and young people. So I looked at the link between Christianity and mental health for my undergrad dissertation, um, which kind of led me on the path to young people because I realized there's really not that much written about it. And the stuff that is written about young people in Christianity I couldn't see myself in it. It was mostly about evangelical young people. And I was like, that's not me. That's not helpful for me. That's not expressing my views. Um, so then my masters, I came to Edinburgh to look at world Christianity to do bit, to be able to do ecumenism, interfaith, like all of these different like, things, a little bit of theology, how scary is that? Um, and my master's dissertation looked at the Edinburgh 2010 Centenary Conference. And there, there was meant to be a 30%, um, like the, the delegation was meant to be 30% young people and young people was um, deemed under the age of 30, but they achieved just under 10% being under the age of 35 in the end and, and presented that as, as a success. Um, so they were marginalized numerically. And then also when it came to the conversations, young people tried to bring up in this collective document that they made during the conference, that uh, binary, there were only binaries with gender and sexuality being like the normal, like male and female and he like heterosexual. And the young people there in 2010 were like, well, that's not representative, can we change it? Um, and they, they were not allowed to do so. The, a few evangelical members went up to the people in charge of the mission board and said, if you do put anything like that into um, this document, we won't sign it. So for me like that, that misuse of power um, was another reason that kind of pushed me on this road of looking at young people again. Um, so my PhD, that's where this comes in. And I decided to kind of explore those things that haven't really been explored before. So the, the, main, uh, the main push for the PhD is understanding mission. And um, that's why I've got the two case studies, the Iona community and the council for mission. 
So they might seem completely at opposite ends of the spectrum at first glance, but actually they both include uh, broadly reformed Christians, um, and they both now have more uh, a kind of same-ish understanding of mission. Mission is in, it's about everyday discipleship, every person, every church doing their own mission. It's mission being in the world and being alongside people. Um, so, um, and they also are quite understudied case studies. Um, so the London Missionary Society, so the precursor to CWM has had quite a lot of research done on it, but CWM post the change from 1977 hasn't really been studied very well in academia. So that's one reason. And the Iona community as well, there's quite a lot written about the Iona community, but it's written from the insider's perspective. Um, so you have like uh, reflections from people who have been in charge or the leaders of the community. You have like the biography of George McLeod, but they're also written quite romantically. They kind of like see the past that they want you to see, which I, I, an insider can't help doing. And they're still useful, but again, it's not a more objective theological uh, way of understanding them. So my outline looks at the change in geography and direction of mission. So both of them in some sense started from the centre and went out. The London Missionary Society started in London and um, went out to convert the heathen world into the, the Christian way. Um, and the Iona community went to Iona uh, with a kind of like training ground almost to then go back to the suburbs and the industrial estates where people kind of go went away from Christianity and were getting like converted into communism. Oh gosh, could you imagine that? So that was really the push for the Iona community to go back into the parish and reignite um, Christianity, Christianity there. And obviously now that geography is completely different. That's not what mission means anymore. When we think about mission, we don't think about going out into somewhere very unexpected, but we think about mission in our own, like in our own communities. Um, and then I'm trying to understand the, the uh, history and tradition in understanding mission theology. So when we think about our theology of mission, how has history been used to reconceptualize what it means now? For a long time, the, the Council for the Mission tried to ignore its, its past history almost and kind of think about what it means to do mission completely fresh away from it. And now it's kind of going completely the opposite way and thinking, well, how do we say sorry for these legacies and um, build back these bridges? The Ionian community, on the other hand, um, was very, very uh, linked to its history through this idea of a Celtic Christianity, which the vast majority of it is completely made up in the founder's mind. Um, he uses his imagination and creative license to talk about what would what Celtic Christianity would have been like in 6th century Scotland. Um, the ideas are like salmon being used as a Celtic symbol to, to justify why he's buying a row of cottages in Camus. Um, the, uh, even the idea of the wild goose, which is really popular, there's, there's no evidence of Columba using that at all. Um, but it's caught on, and that was a lot of reasons of how he was able to do such creative and really outside of the box mission at that time for the kirk and he used a lot of ideas that he also pillaged from other denominations to amass it in this celtic ideal so no one would pick him up on it and then i've got a chapter about ecumenism and mission and then finally today we're looking at young people and mission so this is basically one half of chapter six of my phd thesis so and a very short introduction to the iona community so Ronald Ferguson records in McLeod's biography, the founder of the community, on multiple occasions having to bribe local boys whom he had met at youth clubs to go into the church that was not for the likes of us. The situation of class divide was dramatic at the time of his induction into Govan in 1930, which even that was unusual. This man was, was born into a family of Kardashian, if, if this was now, they're like the lineage of the Kardashian family and celebrities, like the, the McLeod family in Scottish, um, like Church of Scotland Christianity were, were famous, so he had a lot of weight on his shoulders. He got the assistant um, ministry, minister position in St Cuthbert, the Edinburgh Cathedral, um, and, and the Edinburgh Cathedral St Giles, which were really big places. He was going to go up in the world an easy path, but he decided that wasn't for him. 
he gave that up and he went to Govan, which was one of the poorest parishes in, uh, in Glasgow at the time, with an estimated 80% unemployment in the region. And he decided that that's where he would do his ministry. His concern for it and his gifts for the average working class person was not claiming uh, Irish, uh, Irish immigrants for uh, the unjust uh, ideas that were in Scotland at the time. If you want to read more at that, I would um, suggest reading Stuart Brown. He talks a lot about it and that's really, really interesting. Um, but that basically is that that's what he came into. He came into ecumenism, meaning organic unions. And the Kirk existed for the, the middle class, upper class person. It was a very upper class institution. In his original submission to the trustees of the Iona experiment in 1935, MacLeod wrote, if Christianity is the only answer to communism, which was a threat, Christianity must be more concerned with its corporate witness or else we deserve to perish by default. The lost potential of spreading the gospel to young men by the parish church was the motivation for him starting the Iona community. He writes in the first issue of the community's magazine, which is still going today, The Coracle, unless our Christian democracy makes more forthright experiment the youth of our land will never will not forever be put off by our mere disclaimers that ours is a faith for the world superior to communism and fascism it is by our fruits we are known so from the outset we see a concern for the younger generation and an enthusiasm for real world application of the faith the wide reaching aim however is not immediately noticeable in the makeup of the community that he created the new brotherhood the original iona community consisted of 50% craftsmen and 50% ministers in training for the Church of Scotland, who spent the summer together in incredibly basic conditions for the purpose of rebuilding the historic Iona Abbey. Cathy Galloway has commented, in contrast to the diversity of the Iona community membership today, a less inclusive community would be hard to imagine. Behind a successful boys and girls club in Govan, and these young people wanted to be involved with their charismatic minister's new adventure. Yet Dun Duncan Finlayson, who recalled to Anne Moore, who did an oral testimony of the Iona community, when he was asked in the early days if he was planning to involve young people, he uh, commented that if the community gets drawn aside into getting involved into young with young people, it'll be a complete disaster. In typical McLeodian fashion, three years later, him and John Summers decided that youth groups needed a Christian renewal. And the men started a youth group in Canongate on the 4th of January in 1942. This was against many of the Church of Scotland contemporaries at the time who thought that this should be a government prerogative and it wasn't the role of the kick. The one instant that diminished McLeod's enthusiasm, however. During an invited talk to the Rotary Club of Leven in August 1949, which MacLeod described as a beautifully Tory and militaristic collection of pleasant and successful businessmen, he confidently made his claim for the community's youth work. He questions during his speech what Christianity is, asking is it sentimental comfort, pleasure or a cheap and inferior form of dope, or is it the living witness of men? MacLeod retaliates against the government scheme, refusing the idea that the church has nothing to say to youth and presents youth work as an integral requirement for Christian mission, explaining that personal contact and Christian example with these young people would cleanse, change, and control the communities in which they live through education, discipline, and specialization. Presenting his skills with communicating with the upper classes, MacLeod makes youth work attractive to big businessmen who are nervous of the increasing communist influence on trade union movements at the time by ensuring community control through his endeavours with young people. MacLeod's Christian Workers, Leads, uh, Workers League, CWL for short, would offer a counter -att attraction to the increasingly popular Young Communist League. In complete contrast to MacLeod's laissez faire attitude to historical accuracy, he devoted much attention and research to his work with young people to justify his plans. The youth file in the archives left by MacLeod includes several editions of the Roman Catholic Young Christian Workers magazine, ordered by MacLeod on the 22nd of September 1940. Also in the Easter of 1941, MacLeod and Summers attended their, the Young Christian Workers Youth Conference in Birmingham. 
And although McLeod was quick, quick to state their divergence in the common faith, some has reported that he owes more than I can ever say to the hints gained from the Roman Catholic movement. The Roman Catholic movement's pursuit was to embrace the whole life of the worker. And this immediately connects to McLeod's vision of relevant lived theology and evangelism. His talents for communicating for and with young people were quickly noted. A donation of £20,000 a year for several years came from Sir James and Lady Lithgow. It was first given anonymously, but then they sat on the trustee board in February 40, 1943. And the aim was to further the work of the Church of Scotland among young people in accordance with the principles of the Iona community. Being convinced that the future welfare of the people of Scotland is bound up with and is dependent upon the reassertion of Christian convictions amongst youth and the practice of the Christian faith in terms of likely to call forth from their discipline and devotion for the instruction, training and guidance of young men and women in Scotland in the reformed faith. This explanation of the trust's aim resonates really strongly with MacLeod's plea to the Lavin Rotary, Rotary Club in 1941, including the, the concepts of discipline and the effect of the whole community. So James Lisco was a successful industrialist, inherit, inheriting his father's shipbuilding company in Glasgow, and later owning multiple shipbuilding and steelmaking companies with his brother Henry Lisco. The brothers were brought up devout Presbyterians and donated vast amounts of money to the Church of Scotland. However, Sir James's political concerns also aligned with the nature of the Church of Scotland at the time. In the era of Red Clydeside and the captivation of communism for many impoverished industrialists, Sir James Lithgow publicly criticised organised labour. Young people were considered especially susceptible to the idealism present in the communist message, and Sir Lithgow's trust, later named the Iona Youth Trust, was designed to increase the education, piety and discipline of young people in the reformed faith, but it was also about decreasing the attractiveness of communism for young people to protect the status quo of asset multiplication, elitism and the established kirk. However, that wasn't the way of the Iona community. The method for the Christian Workers' Lead, the Iona um, Youth Club, was to encourage the boys to think for themselves. And this actually enabled them to go beyond the structure of the, of the Iona community and include women three months, just three months after the Christian Workers League opened and 30 years before the Iona community as a whole would make this decision. They had a girl and a boy president elected for six months terms and an executive committee of four. And they had a general meeting once a month and only those under the age of 25 could vote and could make decisions in the Christian Workers' League. The resources that MacLeod collected to research for this youth group included an information booklet entitled How to Start a Section, which outlines Joseph Cardinal Cardin's See, Judge, Act method for working with young people and forming their faith in solidarity with those who are marginalised. McLeod and Summers used this method identically for his own youth group, producing handouts which outlined the problem to be seen, the questions to guide the judgment, and the ideas to inspire the action for young people. The kinds of issues that would be discussed ranged from employment choice, apprenticeship treatment and housing conditions, to the immoral literature of film and the attitudes towards parents. An interesting example of how these conversations progressed is the week focusing on films. The exploration into American films alongside questioning their morality around issues of marriage and divorce, questioned capitalism and its get rich quick anyhow style, which McLeod affirmed kept people away from questioning their current housing conditions. Additionally, when thinking about housing issues, it was encouraged that the boys think about how this could affect a person's health, their body, their ability to read and think for themselves, their mind, and their religion, morals and character, their spirit, seeing an intertwining of well-being and faith. The young members would also work in the community, visiting pensioners who live by themselves twice a week, putting on concerts from there for them, campaigning for better pension support, and also managing an allotment to be able to give vegetables to around 60 involved older members of the community. 
The CWL also maintained a relationship with the Young Communist League, debating and dialoguing, and this grounded, this grounded relationship helped the Kirk side with the Scottish left in the 1960s and 70s in their campaigns against nuclear weapons. 1943 saw this group come to Iona in the summer and start the famous Iona Youth Camps. And a lot of the activities that were practiced in the Christian Workers League clubs were later replicated in these camps. John Jardine, who was youth secretary in the 1950s, wrote about how five to six hundred young people came to the camps to Iona each summer from a great variety in social backgrounds and their accents differed as much as their occupation. They braved the less than idyllic conditions of worn down tents, no running water, no electricity, precarious toilets and mostly tinned food. Um, the age was between 17 and 25, but at that time, the average age was actually around 24, 25. So it's really high, I think, if you think about it now, like the kind of when we think of a young person nowadays. Um, the youth camps were an opening of the community to young people, enabling the young person's full participation in worship and the thought of their community leaders. The recorded reflections state that both parties, the host and the receiver, were as influenced as the other by this month-long act of hospitality. By the end of each week, the small island saw tears leave the young people's faces as they welcomed a new group of campers at their departure. Ferguson comments that young people, male and female, from many parts of, from many different denominations and backgrounds, made an enormous impact on the life of the Iona community. The experiences of the camps led young people to partition for their own membership, which was enacted in 1944. The Iona community engaged ecumenically through its work with young people, and these same young people pushed the community out of its creative Presbyterianism into an internally ecumenical community. And their comments that despite the fact that young people did not originally feature in MacLeod's original vision for the Iona community, countless young people first learned what it meant to belong there and they wanted to continue this sense of, belong of belonging. There is actually quite a lot of confusion about the order that associate memberships were created in the Iona community. However, the primary literature records that a women's associate membership was established already in 1943, and by 1944 had 240 members. And the Coracle points to both the stream of layman and youth associate membership being explored concurrently in 1943. Morton attributed the action of young people insisting on their involvement as opening up the general lay associateship. And Galloway also claims that the change in the makeup of the community came about organically, not from an, an internal change of heart from established members, but from others on the outside who lobbied to be included. Youth work was focused on two areas, youth delinquency and education students, both outreach areas, however, However they were envisioned, however, they gave a lot to the Iona community. Whether that was hope, theological understanding or political knowledge, I think both parties were influenced. And um, Morton, who is an ex-leader of the Iona community, said that young people actually changed the face of Iona. However, that only went too far. In the trustee meeting of the Iona um, Youth Grant in 1950, Sir James Lithgow, in a letter, states his concern about the political nature of the Iona Youth Trust's community house, the biggest project of this um, grant, which created a really big space in Glasgow that welcomed all young people and everyone to do things like um, theological classes, political classes, drama classes, art classes. It was quite impressive. However, he stated that membership to the Iona community seems to imply also a membership to the Socialist Party. MacLeod refutes this and reassures Lithgow that the community holds within it multiple political convi convictions. However, Sir James Lithgow res resigned from the trustee board, though his wife Gwendolyn stayed, it's pretty cool, on the 4th of September 1950. He outlined in his resignation letter that the lines of approach suggested in Community House suggest permit, per, per, permanent participation in party politics by the instructions, instructors. 
This does not accord with my views as I am totally opposed to associating religious instruction with the doctrines of a political party. However, he acknowledged that he was not an expert in these matters and that it would be unfair for a grantor of the trust to overly influence its direction. This central experiment of the youth trust was designed as a completely open planned and accessible space. The chapel wasn't even separate from the dining hall and even the warden's flat was not come off, cut off from the wider center. Ian Renton paints the scene well. You had criminals, Borstal boys, divinity students, students from the university, people off the street for lunch, everyone in one space. The community house sought to explore faith, politics and real world issues through debate, fellowship and creativity. Aimed at young adolescents who had left school, the centre provided a space for the blindly optimistic youth to rekindle their hope and find purpose in their depressing context through discussion, study, Bible study and action. And young people were also given the opportunity to listen to quite impressive theological discussions. For example, the Iona Youth Trust organised a four week seminar series at Community House in the spring of 1947 named The Church in the World Today, four addresses and a forum for discussion of students on the message of the church confronting man in society. The series invited Leslie Newbegin, Thomas Forsyth Torrance, Henry Whiteley and George McLeod to address the audience with Professor George Hoggarth Carnaby McGregor and Archie Craig as the chairman. It's quite an impressive lineup. This positive reinforcement of the capabilities of young people continued with Penry Jones, who was employed from 1948 until 1958 as the industrial secretary, and he led workshops in the Christian faith and politics. A lecture course, for instance, was offered by Jones from the 19th of October to the 7th of December in 1945, which was entitled Christianity and Communism. Another example of young people not acting in the way envisioned, envisioned was in 1946. Four young people from either the Church of Scotland or the Iona community were granted £120 to attend an ecumenical youth conference in Czechoslovakia. The 1947 World, Council, World Festival of Youth, convened in Prague and sponsored by the left-wing World Federation of Democratic Youth, made a large impact on the young delegates. The Church of Scotland Youth Committee reacted to how the young people were ambushed by the communist youth representatives, attacking Western ideals by creating its own commission, the communist challenge to Christian youth. It's conceivable that the young people were positively shocked and challenged by the left-wing arguments in the conference. For if they only saw the counter at the conference as negative, it's quite unlikely that the youth committee with George Dryberg at the helm would have quickly argued for the dangers and the impact of communist idea, ideals on youth. So I think these two examples um, show a really big contrast of how youth were treated. On the one side, it's all about free thinking and then making uh, their minds up by the, on their own and empowering young people. And on the other hand, it's about controlling and educating and showing that there's a right way of thinking and a wrong way of thinking to align with the church at the time. Fasting forward just a couple of decades to around nowadays, um, from around 1990, it began to report that um, youth were becoming less and less interested in the programmes of the Iona community. They still remain as one of the community's five year target areas, um, alongside reaching full into communion by 2000. Um, even though the report in 1991, for instance, um, just said that it was trying to increase youth con contracts, the 1992 doesn't mention the community's work with young people at all, despite including a section commemorating George McLeod by remembering his last board meeting, where he urged the community into four directions, the last one being caring for youth. So I thought that was quite ironic. The rest of the 1990s saw um, a concern for the future of the Outdoors Educational Outreach Centre Camus, due to low involvement from young people as well. From 2001, the tone of the Iona Community Report to the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland became more professional and institutionally focused. 
The report of 2001, for instance, rather obscurely and impersonally stated that they were reconsidering the youth policy and that youth, but the youth associates were still meeting. The excitement of seeing young people's lives changed is missing from these reports. We see the yearly youth fest on Iona being reduced in age for 14 to 18 year olds and the youth associates being fully represented and integrated into the community's decision-making bodies and processes in 2003. However, there is, a, there is a lack of depth, but that's not surprising considering that the youth work team had been reduced to one full staff member in 2005. If we go back to the 60s, we had a team of eight full-time youth workers were employed. The 2012 report um, saw a bit more enthusiasm when two full-time youth workers, Chris Long and Ben Raw, were employed. In 2014, the diversity of the youth work was once again highlighted, and it was affirmed that the youth work meets young people where they are and offers them opportunities to explore what gives life meaning, to connect with others and to know that they have worth, that they fit. This report seems much more in line with the enthusiasm of the 60s and 70s. By 2016, however, funding had been cut and Ben Raw was let go to leave just one time full, one full time youth worker. Chris Long remained and worked with the youth groups on campaigns and demonstrations against nuclear weapons, racism, supporting refugees and asylum seekers and tackling climate change. He also began a new community in Glasgow called iGlow, which is just about still going today. We see, a daunting, we see daunting challenges, however, and in 2008, the community decides not to replace their full-time youth worker when um, Chris Long retires because he didn't have enough support. Um, they commissioned a youth worker part-time to do an audit of the community. And he stated that we are less likely to include the most vulnerable in our society who have numerous barriers set against them if we don't employ youth workers. And he warns that the community's youth work will soon be made up of the children of community members. The community has moved from youth work as being one of its core commitments that was also recognised as having the ability to renew and enhance the community itself to something procedural that needs funding and attention. This is a shift in the community's theology, as young people are no longer seen as a priority for mission, nor are they seen as a priority for the ecumenical balance of the community. Additionally, working class people have historically come into the community through encounters with youth work. If a diversity of people are not reached as young people, then it can be assumed that the whole makeup of the community will suffer from a lack of diversity as adults engaged in their work or their churches are less likely to invite or engage with a stranger at a Christian camp like young people would. Morton, the Acts leader, in describing the three phases of Iona, described the first one being the legacy of MacLeod, the second being the family as seen by the members, and the third being the face that looks out onto the world and the belief that Iona has something special to the other and that the other is entitled to. Here he distinguishes between the real body of the community and those on the outside. An interesting reflection would be to ponder on where the community, where young people are in the community. Are they on the inside or on the, on the outside? Are they entitled to work? Um, do they need the attention of their own community? That could be distributed somewhere else. Are they something to mission out or are they something to mission with? Perhaps those who have organically grown up in the community are somewhere else to do than the working class young people who were ministered to for decades. Um, the disadvantaged young people who are, have been changed by the encounter with the community for decades are no longer really um, ministered to. So this, this is kind of the, this is kind of the, the issue that we're we're trying to tackle today. Just got a few questions. So when we go into the breakout groups now, sorry, I've just like blown like a lot of information on you. Um, with, um, with my friend. So in my group, we're going to be answering these questions. So how do we keep the balance between understanding and allowing young people to have their own agenda, yet supporting their mission? Has the place of youth work changed? What problems can we see with the term youth work? 
how are the contexts of the late 1930s industrial Scotland and contemporary Scotland or Britain different or similar? Does this affect our action? Should we be doing the same things as Bacard was doing in 1930s? Possibly. Or should we be doing something different? Is youth work completely different now to what it was then? And lastly, what role should young people play in mission? So that's what you're going to be doing with me and with Lindsay, you'll be coming up with questions that you can come back um, into the main room afterwards to ask me. So thanks everyone for listening. Thank you so much, Victoria, uh, for that huge amount of information for us uh, for us all to digest. But uh, really appreciate that, and it's great to have the the background, the context, and the contrast, I guess, between the way in which it was initially set up and and what it looks like now. And uh, I think that raises challenges for all of us uh, wherever we are at the moment, wherever our our church is. Mm. But it's it's good to gather back again. I think um, the first question, Victoria, um, that I want to pose is, is the last one that just came up. There was um, some discussion started about um, um, resourcing and about all sorts of, of detail. But th there was a question about whether or not you had any sort of um, experience uh, case studies of really where it's happened, really successful, where young people um, have been encouraged um, uh, through mission uh, to to um, uh, to to faith, I guess. But the, the the conversation then developed sort of more into what does that look like? Are we still expecting people to come into a Sunday morning church service? Is that what success might look like for young people to suddenly be, you know, filling our pews on a Sunday morning at eleven? Or is our idea of success much broader than that? Which is where our conversation started to go. So I appreciate that's quite a mixed up question but I, I guess if it started with you know case studies of where it's really worked where it's been successful um young people getting involved in in mission amongst other young people um but also um what does that look like now how does that look different that's that's a great question i love that question um so i uh, in March last year, I did a, a, a paper, I gave a paper to a conference in Westminster College in Cambridge. Um, and the whole idea of this paper was to try and talk about um, how young people are kind of moulding the URC youth and, and the church to kind of be what they want it to be. Um, so I was talking about how not all of them go to a local church and a lot of them see Laureen's just smiling because she knows what I'm going to say. A lot of them see URC youth as their church and that fellowship with the other young people is what they understand as their discipleship and their ministry. And the fit, and I was just talking about how they want to get involved in like social justice issues and JPIT and they could sit on the boards of the URC and all these different ways and how the URC could integrate young people beyond the local church. And the first question I had was, but how do we get them back on a Sunday? And I could have like exploded because I was just like, well, these are all of the, the creative ways that they want to be involved. But you just want to see them sit in on a chair listening to the preacher on a Sunday. So I think um, for me, I think that's my successful model of, of where it's going. Um, things like Pete Ward's Liquid Church and like way, ways of that, that young people, I think, so the URC youth that I'm involved with as well, um, they were the first, one of the first to start online church during COVID. Before so many churches with so many staff got their head around Zoom and things like that, a group of young people just organically did it. Um, and the first Sunday of lockdown, they, we did a church and young people just did it. Like they, they, they researched licensing, they did all of that stuff. Um, and we just ministered to each other and that's still going. And for me, I can't think of a more successful model of mission for young people like they are involved and committed to the URC, but they're also open minded. They are constantly enthusiastic about things like sexuality um, like refugee status, things like that. Food, hunger, poverty, justice. Um, they're getting into Palestine, you know, like all of these issues and they just inspire and just feed off each other. So I think it's also it's not um, making young people come into an into general space where they're marginalised. If young people are still going to that, that's amazing. But I think you, we also have to realise that that's really difficult. It's really difficult to be the one young person in a really 
40 to 80 year old space because I think your worldview is so different. Um, so I think those spaces where young people can go together are really, really important. That's fantastic, Victoria. Thank you for that. And I think um, I, th I think part of what we need to do is is turn that around and, and what success looks like um, and, 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 and sort of move on from our, what might be our idea of what that looks like. Um, the, the next question, I think you've probably just answered actually through there. I don't know what other people think. Somebody asked a question about um, uh, whether on the balance between the social action and the being impassioned about social issues, as you've just as you just mentioned, and faith, and whether young people are drawn in because of the social action and then grow their faith, or whether they they start with their faith and then because of that become interested in the social action issues, and. Um, whether or not one has more emphasis. So people aren't really bothered about the faith and just want to be dealing with climate change or something. But actually your, your story just then about online church suggests that, that it's definitely intertwined. And um, before I pause to let you answer, it's, it was also in the context of the Iona community and whether or not uh, in those early days, those young people were drawn in more because of the social situation, more because of their social circumstances or more because of the faith, whether you'd got a sense of that. Yeah, um, so I think I went I went to a webinar a few weeks ago that was about the economy and ecology, and it was Ruth Valero and Rome Williams speaking. And one of the comments was talking about um, the influx of Labour supporters and how young people only want to support social action because it makes them feel better. And I was just why I, I knew that I was the only young person under 30 at that webinar for sure. Firstly, and um, secondly, how are we having this homogen homogenous group of young people who all think the same? And thirdly, I, I don't think that they do social action because it makes them feel better. Um, are young people just drawn because of the social action? I think to answer that question, I would like to say that young people are not drawn to a church who doesn't that doesn't care about social action. I think young people from the early days of the student Christian movement, um, people got excited because it was the idea of like a holistic incarnational theology, like your faith was being lived out. I think young people search for authenticity. They, I think they, they smell out a preacher who's preaching something that he's not practicing. I think young people are like forming their identity, they're forming who they are as people um, and trying to make the world a better place. They're trying to understand what justice look like, looks like. They're trying to understand their passions. And I think, if they go to a church where that's not important and all that's important is, is sitting in a pew on a Sunday, you know, that's not the kind of life that they want to lead and that's not an influence that's, that's useful, you know? So I think, I actually would say that you can't divorce the two. Like for me, I couldn't be a Christian without being involved in social action because they're, they're not, you can't separate them. I either am a disciple and I live as a Christian or I don't. And I think all the young people I know, like, like my, the group that I'm studying, I think they would say exactly the same, is that if you're a church who's not living out the word, then you're not really a church, if that's helpful. And then uh, the second question about uh, young people in the Iona community. Um, yeah, I think, I don't know, whether, I think it was a lot more normal to be a Christian in that time as well, though, even though, you know, they, they were getting influenced by communism and things like that. I do think that it was still the culture was you, if you were Scottish, you were part of the Church of Scotland, you were a Presbyterian. So going to a Christian youth group might have been a bit intimidating because it wasn't necessarily aimed for the working class, but it wasn't as um, ordinary as it is now. And there was, um, in the archives, there was a bit about uh, young people went and they did like a play and they toured some of Scotland for like a week giving this play. Um, and it was just said that, you know, doing the daily prayers was as normal as, as rehearsing lines. Um, and I think that, I mean, we've seen it with Soul Survivor and things like that as well. Like young people really are like engaged with their faith, um, like spirituality. And I was told by my undergraduate the other week how um, like which pagan TikTok has blown, blown off of young people like on TikTok exploring different forms of spirituality. So I do think young people are really interested in it, but I do think it's more of a daunting thing to think about than social justice and things like that, which are so much more immediate and easy to get on board with. And I do think that like the practice comes 
first quite a lot of the time it's more accessible and then when you're doing that practice that's when the faith kind of comes and the questions can start to be asked um is one more important than the other i don't think so i think they're mutually I mean, I think when you're thinking about ministering to a young person, I don't think you're just looking at just teaching. I think like it's, it's a whole life formation, like a young person trying to figure out who they are in its entirety. So you can't just give them the, the gospel without also helping them to to live out that gospel. So I think it, they're both yeah, intertwined. Thanks, Victoria. And I think I think the, the, the comments in the chat sort of back that up that idea that it's a cyclical thing almost that it's that, that they're inter intertwined sort of inextricably linked and um, the two of them need to go hand in hand don't they but um, thank you for that um we had a, a couple of people raised um the point that it's often the older as in often significantly older people in our congregations who really recognize what young people are all about because they remember it or recognize it from their own sort of active youth um, and whether or not we had a skip generation where young people didn't care so much or whether when you're in middle age and your focuses are elsewhere and you forget that aspect of yourself I don't know but it seems to be the older people who really recognize and and um uh, connect with young people and 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 that sort of that spirit of, of activism perhaps that spirit of, of, of social action um can you are, th are there any ways can you have you got any ideas for how denominations can learn from that sort of uh lifting up um uh of of others inviting that invitational relationship between younger people and older people and trying to lift up those younger voices um that maybe we, was seen in that in that early Iona community yeah I think I think the model of, of see judge act is is a really good one um because it just kind of I think I think the premise was is also that you are teaching young people at the same time you're teaching them how to think but you're not teaching them what to think and I think that's that's where we need to go I think we need to say, like, we want young people involved in our church, but we also have to recognise that young people are going to change the church and that that's OK. I mean, so uh, there's so the URC have the best integration of young people in the General Assembly out of all the denominations and um, the reformed denominations anyway. Um, but before the URC Assembly, they have an event called What Do You Think? where they all sit together and discuss the motions collectively so that when they go into the General Assembly, they're not on their own, like just doing, doing that, you know, really scary process. So I think things like that are really important that we need to recognise that we kind of need to see young people as their own cultural category, not trying to hom homogenise an experience of the young person because like the class difference, racial difference, gender, sexuality difference, like there's, there's a lot of diversity in that already. But I think a generational worldview is quite different to the one above like my views I know are completely different to my parents' views even though we get equated quite a lot because we're related so I think that can happen with young people but also like they just need to have their own space because they're all forming their identity and where they are in life at the same time so I think we need to have a bit of both I think we need to enable young people to think for themselves but at the same time give them the tools and give them the tools in church and I think that starts early from letting like children join in church like letting them play instruments and ha like ask questions things like that and then when we get older I think enabling more integration I think young people like teenagers is when they're asking the questions I think we need to allow the space for the questions um and be like an approachable person I think never saying no like why, like we need to question things like well why aren't young people coming to our general meeting why aren't young people allowed to vote why couldn't this young person sit on the leadership of the church you know um and just kind of get rid of our own presuppositions as well and kind of think like how can we empower these young people like what do they like doing how can we help them and i think that yeah i, I yeah i do agree that the older generation have more time for younger people um I mean, I've got a lot of, um, there's a lot of older men in, in around my church who've been so helpful for me as well and empowering um, or just older people in general. I don't know why that is. That's a really interesting question. <laughs> I've also too, it was, uh, yeah, it was, it's a good one. Um, 
Possibly as part of that, I mean, I, I know that um, uh, you, a, a, a traditional church service doesn't allow room for those questions. You said about, you know, being allowing space, allowing, you know, patience and space and time for questions to be answered. And I think a traditional sort of hour Sunday morning service is usually usually top down uh, and delivered at you rather than than with you. And and young people are not used to learning like that. That's not that's not what school looks like anymore. It's not what college looks like. Um, and older people were maybe more used to that kind of delivery of information. Um, but young people want to be participants in the conversation uh, rather than being delivered to as such and I wonder whether that's something to do with it as well whether whether our whole hour-long um, traditional service um, it doesn't sit naturally with the way young people learn. I think sometimes it can but I think there just needs to be kind of different spaces. Okay. I think we also decide that young people aren't spiritual and they don't have that connection, oh, young people can't possibly sit still for that amount of time. Whereas they definitely can, if anyone's been involved in godly play, like children and young people can be still and thoughtful for such a long time, and it's incredible. I, I mean, I've been most um, affected by youth gatherings and like massive global youth gatherings and just seeing the piety and spirituality of other young people around you is just like, it's mind blowing. If you have a young person in your church who's never experienced that, like send them there because they won't not be a Christian after experiencing something like that. I think young people have a really like powerful link to, to God and, and what that means. And I mean, youth assembly, when we do like communion at the end, like young people, they, they cry and they're sitting there and it's so mindful, it's so thoughtful, you know, there's so much stuff going on for young people. Every day is so emotional, I think, when you're a teenager, we know that, <laughs> if you've got teenage kids. So I think that they really do have a link and we have to allow them space for that as well, space for quiet, space for, and there is space for listening. I'm not saying like, young people are always right. We know they're not, um, but there's also space for, for questioning. And I think we have to value them as people and they're not just things to be to be taught or you know they and, and they can't just integrate with the with the larger community seamlessly when they're only seen seen as x or y's son or daughter i think we have to allow them to, to formulate who they are in in our presence as well that's really helpful it's 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 a much more mixed picture than we sometimes assume isn't it um i've got a, another question here about um the, the kind of issue that I think um, a specific issue that you mentioned about young people only being able to reach people like themselves, or at least how very difficult it is um, to, to move beyond that and um, whether or not you think that was the same um, for the early Ionian community, but perhaps more relevantly to us now, whether or not you can see any any strategies or any any models for getting around that. Um. Yeah, back then, um, the first youth worker employed by the Iona community in 1942, he was 23. Um, and he first worked for the government with the first intergeneration, intergender youth group. So there used to be boys groups and girls groups and they mixed them together. And he was the first person employed to do that. And then he came to the Iona community and he was talking about how the average age in the 40s was around 26, 27, and it gradually went down to the 60s and 70s, it was around 23, 24. So he was in charge of this group who were all older than him. Um, and he said, George MacLeod was the most terrifying man he had ever met. And John Summers had a quota for these youth camps that 60% of the young people who went had to be um, for, for like working class, they had to be struggling with money, that, that sort of agenda. And they would be there in the Iona groups. So these Glasgow young people, you know, from, from very, very, very bad conditions. Um, with theology students who were obviously quite upper class, they went to universities, they were in, you know, St Andrews, Edinburgh. And, you know, that was the kind of atmosphere. And, um, but that was his job. It was his job to go out and find people. He said 70% of my time was just walking around the streets, like getting young people in. And I think dispersed youth work is something we also have to go back to, like the idea of like being with young people where they are. And I, I, there was, I went to a CT mission conference last week and there was a guy like, we're going to schools. And I was like, you're forced to be in a school with them. They they have to be there. That's, you know, 
dispersed youth work means like going out on the street and sitting in the car park with loads yeah. of kids who are lost. I think that's what needs to happen. Um, yeah. Um, and then well, when they got into the, the, the youth like festivals that, that would happen, I don't, it wasn't always easy. Like the young people didn't always, you know, you're not always going to agree with everyone. But I think just the act of sitting together and listening to each other changed a lot of people, especially the young people from the working class backgrounds, like, because it just enabled them to think a different way. And they, they were just like asked questions they've never been asked and valued in a way that they hadn't been valued before. And, and like inspired, and I think that's really important. Um, so I don't know if that's answered the question, but I think I think it's no, about- No, I, th like, I, th I, th yeah, I don't think it's a really, yeah, sorry, sorry to talk over you. I, I, I think it's a really um, a nice way to end actually, is it's it, this is about coming alongside people. And, and it doesn't matter maybe what background you're from or who you are, an old person can come alongside a young person uh, when we're talking about working um, with each other, uh, but also in terms of mission, anybody can come alongside anybody else and listen um, and, and, and you will learn and, and, and grow and grow others as well. Um, Victoria, thank you so much. There's a huge amount that we haven't touched on. There's a huge amount of, of, of issues and topics that you've raised. But on behalf of everybody here, I really would like to thank you for your time this afternoon and for all the thought that you've given to this subject.